Hello, everyone. We are waiting for the attendees to join in to the webinar, after which I will start with the introductions. I can already see the attendee count going up. Hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Vindapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. We organize two webinars every month on a wide range of topics around uh, waste being a global issue. Today, the webinar, today's webinar will tackle the topic of plastic recycling in the Caribbean. We have uh, Sean Young, who's the founder and CEO of Seal Environmental Services. Sean has moderated other webinars for us in the past. So please go to the video panel section or go to our YouTube channel and you will find them there. Before we jump into the topic of the webinar, I just want to remind everyone that CL Environmental has been selected as one of the top 50 change makers in the world to exhibit and pitch at the Change Now Summit in Paris in May. So Sean and her team are uh, fundraising for her to be able to go there. I will drop a link to uh, more details about it so that you can all have a look at it and uh, share it ahead. Now, coming back to the webinar, uh, Sean is Sean has put together a panel of three speakers. We have Ronald Roach, who is a director of water and waste services at Unite Caribbean. Majid Mohammed, who among other things is also the COO at SMCL Investments Trinidad Limited. Nalini Suklal, co-founder at Recycling Partners of Jamaica. Uh, just a general reminder to everyone, we will take the audience questions. We already received some of your questions, which has been passed on to the panel. And if you have any other questions uh, that come up during the course of the discussion, please use the Q&A section. Over to you, Sean. Thank you very much, Sweetha. And hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our panel uh, this, well, it's morning where we are. So good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are. Thank you so much for your interest as we begin our discussion on a plastics recycling in the Caribbean. As sweet as that, I am joined by my esteemed colleagues who are representing different perspectives on different parts of the Caribbean. You may hear some of us, you are actually, all of us have the same accent <laughs> because we are all Trinidadian people. We're all from Trinidad and Tobago. However, we are all working in different spaces. So again, we have Ms. Nalini Sukla who and after I just say their names in this order, so you guys get ready, um, they are going to, I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves to you guys as well, because who knows them best than they know themselves, right? So we have uh, Nalini Sukla, who is an environmental consultant and the former general manager of Recycling Partners of Jamaica. And so she would be sharing her perspectives and experiences while she was there. Then we have, Majid Mohammed, who is the chief operations officer, but from his bio, I see he uh, also has an energy experience and a lot more things that he will share. Chief operations officer at SMCL Investment Trinidad Limited, and he will share based on the Trinidad and Tobago perspective and the work that they are doing. And last but by no means least, we have Ronald Roach, who is the director of Waste, Water, and, sanita and Sanitation Department for Unite Caribbean, which is based in St. Lucia, but however, has coverage over the OECS, which means the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. So Ronald will also be sharing his perspective, and he has over 20 years of experience in the waste and wastewater sector. So Nalini, I give you the, your one minute floor to share a bit more about yourself and the work that you've been doing. Thank you, Shan. And of course, thank you, Shweta, for inviting me to this forum. Um, just quickly, I am Nalini Suklal, an environmental engineer by training. I've spent the last decade working in both Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica in the areas of environmental policy and planning, uh, multilateral environmental agreements, landfill management, and of course, plastic recycling. In my most recent posting as shared, I've spent the last three and a half years working for an extended producer organization called the Recycling Partners of Jamaica. 
or the RPJ, as we call it. Uh, the RPJ was established in 2014 in a public-private partnership between the government of Jamaica and some of the major bottling manufacturers on the island. Uh, the aim really being to collect and recycle at least 85% of the approximately 800 million plastic bottles produced and sold in Jamaica each year. And the key focus, of course, of the RPG was uh, PET and HCP plastics. Uh, the end goal, of course, of the RPG and of the venture is to significantly decrease the number of plastic bottles primarily that end up at the dump, not landfill, uh, and which are, of course, irresponsibly disposed of uh, into the gullies, drains, shorelines, and on the streets, as is a common sight across the Caribbean. The RPG strategy, if I'm to share a bit, has focused to date on four key elements, uh, one being infrastructure development, recycling bins, cages, drop-off points and depots across the island, uh, a comprehensive national public awareness and education campaign that has included the schools with a specific schools program, uh, the establishment of a deposit refund system or DRS as we call it, uh, based on financial incentives for recycling. And at present, just to share, this incentive stands at Jamaican $50 per kilogram of PETO HDPE that's returned. And of course, as an organization, we also focus on strengthening our internal administrative processes. Um, one key statistic that I will leave with, with the team and the attendees, as of 2022, the organization was able to achieve a recovery rate of between 15 and 20%, which we consider to be quite significant and you know, well on our way of achieving our very lofty goals. So that's a little bit, Chen. I think I will share more as we continue. Thank you very much, Nalini. Over to you, Majid. Hi guys, um, thank you for the opportunity again. Um, my name is Majid Mohammed, um, SMCL Investments Trinidad Limited. SMCL Investments is a project developer. Um, we look at several projects. Um, one in particular is a bottle-to-bottle RPET -bottle facility, which we would be looking to locate. Um, we were looking around the Caribbean. It may most likely be in Trinidad and Tobago uh, for several reasons we may discuss later on. Um, so what we're looking to do is go straight from our pet bottles back to our pet resins so that um, we could closely and create the circular economy that you know, we we discuss in here um, and which is usually be discussed other places that we hope in for more and more discussions to continue. Um, other projects that we're looking at um, would be off-grid solar hydroponics farm, which we have one that we recently installed and is up and running. And um, we're looking to do some more in that avenue. So um, I've spent time in the power plant industry as well um, in terms of power generation. And um, I have done currently actually doing a couple of energy audits as well. So that's more or less me in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you very much, Majid. Ronald, over to you. Hi, good day all. Um, pleasure to be here. So my name is Ronald Roach and I'm the director of Water and Waste at a regional consulting company known as Unite Caribbean. Unite Caribbean operates in the spheres of governance, economic development, climate change and water and waste. And for uh, the past two years, we have been involved in a recycling project in St. Lucia, working with uh, the government of St. Lucia, the private sectors, and of course the public in developing an incentivized program for plastic waste recycling, focusing on uh, PET and HDP plastic bottles in particular. And that project uh, was a success, but has come to an end, and it evolved into a newer, bigger project called Recycle OECS, which we are currently undertaking. And that project is to develop a regional recycling model for the OECS countries. Uh, and once that model is developed to have demonstration projects in two other uh, OECS countries. So that's it for the time being. And I'm sure I'll be discussing more about those projects as we go along. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ronald. And just a reminder to all our attendees, please feel free to put your questions as they come up in the Q and A box, not the chat, because that is where uh, the team will be looking to be able to draw your questions from. So we don't want them to get lost. And I see we have people from Trinidad and Tobago, we have people from Florida, we have people from India, we have people from Venezuela. I mean, a really nice mix and uh, in terms of people joining us today on the call. So let's guys, let's just jump straight into the conversation. And I wanna start um, with Nalini first. Nalini, you know, what have, what has been some of the challenges that you've experienced um, in your roles? And what are some of the challenges that you've seen um, in Jamaica while you were at uh, Recycling Partners of Jamaica? Well, you know, Sean, it's quite interesting because the challenges that I would have faced there were quite similar to those that I would have faced in, in Trinidad. Right you know? here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it, it lends itself that, you know, we really are one Caribbean uh, from our problems and possibly to finding the same solutions. Um, but if I were to narrow down some of the, the challenges, uh, there are four key ones that I would say. Um, the first is, of course, effecting cultural change. And by that, I mean in the context of recycling. It is not something that it's fairly new. I would say it was fairly new to Jamaica in terms of a being a concerted effort, not just something that's done once a year or a beach cleanup, but integrating recycling into the daily practices and lives of everyday Jamaicans. And um, that type of change, I say, usually would take very much at least a decade. Um, and that was one of the key challenges, getting people to understand, firstly, the why of recycling, um, and then the how-to, uh, because as mentioned, the RPG focused on PET and HDPE primarily, uh, and then also getting them to, to understand that despite a financial incentive, this was really for uh, them and for the future of the island and the people. So that's one, one of the key challenges that I faced, uh, as I said, not just in Jamaica. Um, the other one is, you know, the aggregation of the local agencies and bodies um, to work in tandem because many organizations, as mentioned, the RPG is a public-private partnership, but they're government agencies, there's several NGOs, and many of them have similar goals, especially when it comes to recycling and environmental protection. What we often see is that getting everybody on the same page to, to see and acknowledge that we have shared goals um, is often challenging. Uh, and you know, one of the key benefits of being able to do that is to ensure that the resources are not wasted uh, from duplicated efforts because resources and financing towards these initiatives, as I'm sure my colleagues would tell you, uh, can be very challenging at times. Um, those are the key, two of the key challenges that I've faced. Of course, the long-term financial feasibility of recycling efforts uh, and having it organized and executed in such a way that it is sustainable, I think is also a key challenge for not just Jamaica, but, but for the region. I think Ronald touched on the fact that, that we have a lot of pilot projects, we have a lot of short-term projects, and we learn a lot from them, but translating them into a long-term solution that is there for the long, you know, for the future, uh, has been one of the key challenges that I've seen, not just in Jamaica again, but across the region. Those are a few I can share. Thank you very much, Nalini. Would Ronald or Majid, is there anything else other than what Nalini has mentioned that you would like to add to that, to, to that question as well? What are some of the challenges um, that you have also seen? Yeah, if, if, I, if I can uh, add to that, um, mm -hmm. Nalini alluded to it, but I wanted to re reiterate the point that we often look at plastic recycling from a purely financial point of view. And that has been, in a lot of cases, our downfall. So the reality is, because we are small island developing states, because we don't have the existing capacity to re recycle in-house and in-country, we have to uh, ship to markets abroad in the first instance. Hopefully, we can develop that capacity. 
but um, that is an expensive process and it can't be done solely by the private sector. Um, and that's why there are, have been, you know, a number of attempts at recycling and all are coming to a premature end. And so we have to look at recycling from a more holistic perspective that includes government buy-in, that includes uh, legislative support, that includes financial support and uh, um, financial uh, sustainable financing system. So that is something that I think is important for us to recognize from the onset. When we try to look at recycling purely from a financial point of view, uh, it often does not work out in our islands. Yes, thank you very much, Ronald. I mean, to all of the points that you and Alini would have just mentioned, I certainly agree. You know, we have, even though I say sometimes that all of our islands put together can probably fit in some other countries of the world, it still presents an opportunity for us to be able to work together. And to look at the space, as Ronald just said, not just from um, the marketing, the markets and the financial side of it, but how can we bring all of the players together? And Alini alluded to this as well. How can we bring all of the players together? You know, I often say that we may have different parts, but we're heading towards the same goal. So how can we come together? How can governments come together, um, putting the correct legislation in place? Because sometimes it's not, just about not having the legislation, it may be the lack of enforcement of the ones that already exist. Um, and how can we financially support the initiative? So, um, Majida, I want to I want to ask you this question. Then, um, when we're talking about the financing of initiatives, and that can be a very long, it could be laborious, very painstaking process. From the perspective of SMCL. What was that, uh, what has that process been like for you guys? Because you are coming from this space of we are, yes, private sector, but we are seeking funding, we are seeking financing, um, because it begs the question, you know, is the recycling industry, does it really, is it really possible for us in the Caribbean? Does it really make sense at all? You know, are we, as my mother used to tell me, are we spinning top in mud? You know, are we just moving around in circles and not going anywhere? So, Majid, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So, um, yes, we it is um, something that we need. Recycling, the recycling industry, and it's something that we looked at. Um, so, to answer the first part of the question, it's a long, journal process to get financing because um, it would be considered greenfield in the Caribbean because there has not been or there's very little attempts to close the entire loop. Um, as um, Nalini and Ronald would have mentioned, you know, there's the small parts that we have, and some has been successful in small projects, but to create the full sustainability of a closed loop, what you need is, you know, you need everybody to come together and you need the support from the private sector looking for financing. It's difficult because greenfield projects, there's not much, um, leg room or most financial institutions don't really consider it um low risk you know it'll be still considered a high risk um project so but in terms of the interest rate or even finding investors to um to come in on the equity side it's a bit difficult as well so we have been looking externally um as well as internally and we are there are several interested parties but everyone wants to see some sort of governmental input uh, to create that you know, comfort. So it, it's a, a, a long process. Um, it can happen. It is possible. It's not, um, as, you, as you would say, you know, spinning it up in mud, but it will feel that way at some times, you know, but you have to continue pushing forward, which is what we have been trying to do. Thank you very much, Rajid. And one of the key points um, that Ronald mentioned is that the finance has to be sustainable, not a one-off thing. You know, um, I was watching, um, I do watch TEDx talks from time to time, and I cannot pronounce his last name, so I'll just go with his first name. Busi said that for entrepreneurs and people who are developing businesses, especially in this space, we need our money to be long and patient. You know, we don't want, we don't want all of a sudden after the first year, you're knocking my door again, asking me, especially for entrepreneurs in this space, asking, 
uh, for the funds to be returned. So it has to be, it has to be gentle, it has to be long, and it has to be patient. Nalini? Uh, thanks, Shan. I just wanted to add a little bit in terms of the model, and we're discussing the financing models, and I think it's, of course, you know, central to a lot of what we can and can't accomplish, and we've established that. The model, and I know Ronald has said United Caribbean is looking at a regional uh, OECS model, and, you know, it, it's going to be very useful. Uh, I just wanted to share again the Jamaica experience and the fact that the RPJ was constituted via public-private partnership. And, and what that meant and what it means is that uh, the funding comes from the private sector through the bottlers and manufacturers. And of, of more, you know, what, what I found most commendable, Shannon, what drew me to Jamaica and drew me to this, uh, this company and this project was the fact that this is all done voluntarily. There is, you know, there, there's, there, there has been various iterations of legislation, various versions of it, but none of it passed and effected. So the bottlers and manufacturers in Jamaica has been voluntary in that regard by putting their literal money where their mouths are, by acknowledging that they have an extended producer responsibility and putting together an entity like the RPG that works with the government sectors. You know, the government has their, their, their roles by managing the dumps, uh, by general waste disposal. And of course that function remains with the government, but it is definitely a unique model. Uh, and I think it's, it's a model that um, definitely I know Ronald and his team will be looking at. And and uh, one that I really think can bear some fruit by way of financing in particular. Thank you very much for that contribution, Rulini. So it means that looking at financial uh, structures, not just from a, a standard perspective, meaning coming from a bank or a lending agency, but how can we be creative in our financing, just like um, the bottlers and the manufacturers came to the table voluntarily and said, let's do this together. You know, how can we look at look at it from a more, rather than a, it has to come from this particular organization, this particular financial institution, how can we come together and, and see what's the best way to fund the initiative? I like that, Nalini. Thank you very much. Um, so, Ronald, this question is over to you, and then I will jump to a couple of questions that we have in the Q&A. So this question really is about, so we talked about, uh, we were just talking about financing and how we need to be creative. So that kind of is playing on the word innovation in a sense. How can we innovate? How can we make up what we already have better? Um, so how do you see innovation playing a role? in the recycling of plastics in the Caribbean region? I think, I think we need to be innovative in our ideas, certainly. But in terms of technology, uh, I believe it's necessary to stay with the tried and trusted. Uh, if we really have to look at recycling as a main activity in our islands, um, there, you know, there are innovative approaches, but those innovative approaches are usually limited in terms of scope and volume that you can process. Um, for instance, uh, making park benches. And so we have seen uh, some of the Caribbean islands being involved in that. And that's useful. It creates a lot of good public um, education with respect to the need for recycling and so, but uh, the scope is actually limited. So, as, as Majid is doing, looking at bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling, where you're taking one consumer item and making uh, a similar consumer item to be able to, you know, have circularity. Those are the, the technologies that, that we do need to look at. The innovation comes in when you are looking at, as Nilini pointed out, uh, uh, public-private partnerships, voluntary EPR systems, and so forth. I think there's, you know, quite a bit of room for, for that within our territories. But as I said, I think we need to stick with the tried and trusted technology at this point in time, given where we are in terms of our development. Okay, noted. Um, that is an excellent, that's an excellent point. I mean, how we always say, you know, if it's broke, go fix it. So... <laughs> If there are technologies that currently exist that work, that do the job that we need them to do, 
uh, as that can be modeled and retrofitted for the Caribbean region for island communities, then I don't see why we can't use them if there is a way of, you know, any prison, what, what, what we can innovate, as you said, is, is in the how, in the how we present it, in the how we finance it, in the, you know, in that how we educate about it, that is where it presents that room. But if the technology exists and the technology always keeps changing, I mean, I see new pieces of equipment doing more and, and different things all the time. So we have to also be able to keep up with the technology. So thank you very much, Ronald. So I'll go to the first question in the chat from Alton. And Nalini, I'd like you to take this one. What about having the ministry in an EPR organization? Um, any pros and cons? That's from Alphon. Sure. Uh, and the ministry, I'm assuming, would be whatever entity in whichever country that's responsible primarily for. Uh, it could be two things because we've seen, you know, several ministries. For so if we're using Trinidad as, a, as an example, there is, of course, the Ministry of Planning, which handles environmental policy and the multilateral environmental agreements unit. And then there's a swim call, which handles the landfill management and so on. Uh, it's similar in Jamaica, where there's NEPA that handles policy and planning. And then there's uh, the NSWMA, which handles the landfill management. But, you know, the, the ministry or the government, uh, you know, whichever government entity or body is responsible, I do believe has to work collaboratively with the identified EPR. And the reality is that waste is a finite resource in that sense. Um, you know, there is... We, we like to think there's so much plastic and it presents itself as an infinite resource. The reality is from both a financial perspective and a management perspective, there's a limited resource. So if you're looking to make something financially feasible, there has to be lines drawn as to who manages what and where the responsibility lies. So definitely the government has to be at the table. I think working in tandem with the government and an EPR, um, it would define things like, as we spoke about the legislative role, um, the role of, you know, uh, the waste outside of recyclables, for example, which is also important. And it also works in the sense that we have to, present, and this was one lesson learned that we, we actually learned in Jamaica, to present a unified message to the public. Because what we found was, you know, when there are many uh, programs and pilots and so forth, and the ministry says, put out uh, some recyclables on a Tuesday, we have a pilot project, and the RPJ will say, well, bring it to us, we have an everyday, you, you know, the public gets fatigued. And once the public becomes fatigued and disenchanted, it's very difficult to re-motivate them. So I would say definitely the ministries have to be in conversation with the EPRs or any other recycling efforts. We should really sit at one table. And the, the key common goal is that we create unified messaging so that the public is not confused and that they're constantly motivated. And of course, Shan, the bottom line of collaboration, and I always say it, com collaboration over competition, I say it all the time, is that we focus on the resources that we have, that they're not being used poorly by duplication of efforts, which consumes a lot of the very precious resources that we have. Thank you so much, Delini. I mean, as you said it, I, I, I mouthed while you were speaking. I mean, the duplication of efforts in the region is, <sighs> I sigh. <laughs> because we have so much of that happening, um, you know, because it, it is on a competition sort of thing rather than a collaborative sort of effort, you know. As you said, it is about one message, one language. We know we have many voices, but one message, one language. So I really appreciate your comments there. So Majid, this second question is specifically directed for you. Uh, Vandana asks, will you be working with current collection organizations such as Every Bottle Back or I Care, or will you be launching a new collection service? Additionally, will you be using the resin to manufacture bottles yourself or will you be selling locally and or exporting? That's Vandana's question. So you have two, yeah. two questions in there. Two parts, you, yeah. Two parts in that question, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's actually two great questions. Um, and stemming from what um, Nalini and you just mentioned, the duplication of efforts, SMCL recognized that uh, very early. And um, we are very open to partnering with anyone in the industry to work together to not duplicate these efforts and really um, take it to the next level. So what we would like to do is work with all the collectors, anyone who is interested in collecting bottles, uh, we want to work with them and, and we will take the bottles off their hands. Um, we will produce and to answer the second part, we will be generating for the um, for the bottlers and anyone in that industry who would import, because in Trinidad Tobago, we import close to um, 10,000 tons of resins to manufacture um, our pet, well, PET bottles and um, other products from PET and other resins as well. So we would actually be um, selling back to these bottlers so um, they wouldn't need to import, right? Um, the resins, preforms, and probably the thermoforms which are the flat sheets um, to manufacture the containers because those containers now, recycled containers are, are something that is growing in Trinidad as well and Tobago. So um, yes, definitely we'll be trying to work. We have um, um, communicated with um, several institutions already and if there's anyone else out there who is uh, willing to work with us, we'll de be definitely interested. So I hope I answered both part of the questions there. Uh, I hope so, Fandana could let us know <laughs> if you didn't, but thank you so much, Fandana, and thank you, Alison, for your questions. Um, Ronald, I want to ask you this question, um, and I'm kind of merging uh, Matthias's question and Corbin's question in one because they're almost uh, intertwined. So, and their question is about the integration of chemicals recycling with plastics, uh, with waste plastics. So, what are your thoughts on partnerships with chemical international chemical companies to export waste plastics on the island to their facilities to be processed? Um, and I know, Nalini, you may have some insights on there as well. So the general question is about, and I um, is about exportation of the plastics outside of the Caribbean region. So you could talk about your thoughts on that, and do you see any? partnerships with international chemical recycling companies, for instance, to be possible for us in the region. Mr. Ronald? Yeah, so I think it's a question of the opportunities that are available. And certainly, as we discussed right now, there aren't any opportunities for recycling within the Caribbean, and we therefore have to look externally. Uh, whether or not chemical recycling uh, is, is suited to us, I think some more in-depth exploration has to be done of that. Mechanical recycling usually is, is, a, is a cheaper, simpler option. And again, because of where we are, I think, you know, we, simplicity is the key. We need to continue a simple approach. Uh, the islands, we don't have uh, too much experience with recycling, and therefore we want to start up uh, simple and then build from that. But it doesn't mean that you know we we won't explore those possibilities and determine the feasibilities, the shipping costs, um, the price that is paid, because to some extent it is you know a financial uh, transaction. So certainly, I think there's um, there is interest in it, and um, and it's something yeah that we are willing to explore. Thank you, Ronald. Uh, Majid or Nolini, you all have any thoughts on that question as well? Nalini, your mic, I see your mic is on this. Yes, you know, I, I can I, I completely agree with what Ronald has said. In Jamaica's experience, we were sending the plastics off island. Uh, Pre-COVID, we did have an on-island mechanical um, recycling plant that was operated by an international firm with uh, locations across uh, several countries, uh, Jamaica being one of them. But with the onset of COVID presented a lot of challenges, unfortunately that plant closed. What it meant for the RPJ is that our collected plastics had to be exported, as Ronald alluded to, which added a whole element of logistics and additional financial costs. 
Um, and so, of course, the, in, in that case, uh, chemical recycling was not considered. Uh, we would have stuck with our same mechanical recycler, but at a different country. So it was be, being exported. I think definitely we have to look at some sort of in-country or regional approach, be it chemical recycling or, you know, to mechanical recycling, whatever the option is. But a, a regional um solution for that collected plastics uh, on the various islands. Um, apart from, you know, the logistics of shipping and the cost of it, you know, we are looking at changes globally. I mean, the, the Basel Convention recently added amendments on the, the plastic waste component. And, you know, in, in looking at the future, we, we're looking at transboundary movement of plastics may, may see some changes in terms of how we're able to export or if we're going to be able to export and in what capacities and quantities uh, and what the rising costs will be. So I think definitely some element of regional uh, circularity has to be established for, apart from the collection and, and so on, for dealing with uh, the collected plastics, uh, and I believe Majid and they are going along and exploring that path as well. Um, so, you know, definitely, it, you know, chemical recycling can be considered, but that has been the experience to date. Majid, you want to add anything before I wrap up that question? Yeah, just um, one thing to add to it, um, you know, in terms of... Um, and as Nilini mentioned, the transboundary movement, uh, we have been looking at that very closely because um, we recognize that collection, if collection is an issue, because for most facilities that, that like the one we are proposing, you need to make sure that you have the quantities um, for your, of your raw material in terms of the amount of, um, of plastics that we, we have to come in. So we have also been looking at regionally to possibly bring in any plastics to make sure that we have the quantities that is required. Um, so that is with respect to that. With the chemical, yes, um, you know, we have looked at that as well, but because the mechanical is so established in the Caribbean and because, you know, our progress is so slow, it's, it's kind of a bit difficult, but it's not impossible. Thank you very much, Majid. And I do like so Corbin, your options may be to set up a location in Caribbean region <laughs> if the if that's what your interest is um rather than us uh having to ship it out to any island outside of the Caribbean region because as Lenini said and as Majid just reiterated uh the cost of doing so can be quite high and quite exorbitant and so we ourselves need to look at our at solutions within or either within our own countries or within the region. And I'm more leaning towards the regional approach. That's just my personal opinion, um, because at least there would be a location um, that no matter where we are, we can all take our plastics and then benefit from the products of that um, activity as well. Um, I like the FUBU approach, you know, I like for us bias, right? <laughs> I like the FUBU approach. and so. I think we have the talent, we have the resources, we have the skill sets right here in the region to be able to do quite a lot. So there's another, so there are a couple other questions in the chat. So Rashmi asks, um, and anyone could tackle this, is there any micron or thickness needed for smooth processing of the recycling of plastic in terms of cost and technology? Uh, well, most of the yeah, uh, so most of the, the 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 technology or the front end line of the equipment we have been looking at um, would cater for various thickness and um, you know in terms of the crushing and, and processing. So it, the answer is no, there isn't any special um, thickness. Uh, the equipment should be able to handle it. Uh, yeah. And I would also assume it, it depends on what is being made to as well, Maji. Depending on what the material is being made for, what is its intended use in, then I figure that that may change depending on. So if you're using it for containers, that might be a little thicker than if it were a bottle or something. That's that's the logical, that's my logical brain thinking. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, I, I was looking at wrong, it. But logically, yeah. that's what I see. 
Um, Actually, you're correct, but I was looking at it from the point of view coming into the plant as mm -hmm. uh, waste plastics. Right, okay. You know, to process okay. the waste plastics. Um, and okay. you are correct in terms of the production side, whatever the client requires, then you, you, you manufacture to that thickness for the equipment. Or for the... Okay, good. wonderful. So, um... I, so this question is for each one of you. I'll start with Ronald first. So Ronald, what are your, what do you see as your top three recommendations for us moving forward with plastics recycling in the Caribbean? You could talk about the OECS or from any perspective, but what are your top three recommendations with how we move forward with plastics recycling in the region? And then we will go to Nalini and then Majid. So y'all can prepare, okay. I, I think we need to, to begin with the end in mind. Uh, so knowing what is it you, that you're trying to accomplish? Is it that you want to increase the life of your landfills? Is it that you want to um, have a cleaner society? And once you know that, then you, you, you can then determine what you're going to uh, get involved in, is it just PET recycling or is it a range of plastics and so. Um, so so that's simply one recommendation. You need to, we do need to consider the regional approach uh, from a holistic point of view, each island in itself, uh, they can't support, um, you know, a recycling plant or so because of the small volumes and therefore you, you do need to look at, at a regional approach. And you also need to look at, um, so the third recommendation would be a multi um, stakeholder approach as well. It can't be private sector alone, it can't be government alone, it can't be the public alone. There must be that collaboration that is required to get an understanding of what the country wants, how is it going to get there, and what are the rules of government, private sector, and the public. Um, one of the big questions that has to be answered as well is who is going to pay for that recycling? Because as I said, uh, there's a net cost to recycling because of the nature of our small islands. And we have to, to, to determine who has to pay. So as part of that collaborative approach, you know, those discussions need to be had and agreements um, made with respect to the financing for recycling. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, you know, when 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 you have a small circle of professionals, and we've worked together, we often share um, similar visions on the way forward. And you know, I can echo a lot of Ronald's uh, sentiments and having had similar experiences. For me, I would say, you know, if I have to narrow it to three. Um, collaboration through a unified regional approach. Uh, we've spoken about this in various iterations. It comes down to two or three main points. One is the feedstock or the, the raw material required to sustain a thriving recycling industry or recycling plant. Um, and we can't do that if we split the feedstock onto every island. We simply don't have enough. So we have to look at it from that perspective as well. We share the same oceans and therefore we have to acknowledge that Jamaica's problem is Trinidad's problem, is Barbados's problem, is everybody's problem. We can't separate ourselves. We share those oceans. And as you've seen, uh, a lot of our trash is currently right there all around us. You know, apart from that, we are islands and many of them, Jamaica at the top of that, are heavily dependent on tourism as a main contributor to their GDP. And the tourism is primarily based on water uh, resources, sport tourism and so on. So um, we have to look at a collective unified approach and one that is collaborative. I would say that we also have to accept assistance from parties that have achieved success, primarily from the technology side of things. Um, I often say we don't need to reinvent the wheel or the recycling plant or whatever. We just have to determine what is the best fit for the region and have consensus on that. Uh, that being said, there are many strategies out there. I do believe that it has to be personalized. Caribbean people are unique. 
uh, and the strategies of communication and awareness that may work in other areas. I think that's one area that is very unique to the region about how we communicate the strategies and the, the why of why we need this uh, is very important because in my experience, we can establish the, the best money back schemes. We can pay money for the bottles. Uh, as we're doing in Jamaica. Uh, we can put the bins there, we could put the cages, but to effect that cultural change, we have to get the people motivated and on board. And that's important. And my last point really in terms of the way forward is that we have to start now. You know, we have been at it in various iterations and various pilot projects, you know, and we're looking for the right way and the best way and the best, but, Time is going by, the problem is becoming larger and larger. Uh, the effects are becoming uh, cumulative and we have to start. And it has to start now. Majid. Yeah, so um, to summarize what, um, what Nalini and Ronald said, you know, um, the three C's, collaboration, coordination, and communication. You know, that's definitely what is required. Um, once we could have that, then we would see um, this industry move um, faster, just as any other industry that is important. Um, my three, it would be collection, collection, collection. We need to focus heavily on the collection. Um, you know, past attempts to do similar projects would have failed because there wasn't enough raw material in terms of waste collected um, bottles. Even though we know that it's being produced, we know that it is out there uh, to be able to collect it and bring it to one point is one of the major issues, even for potential investors. Because one of the first questions would be asked to us when we pitch a new project is, do you all have the raw material? And they want proof to show that we could collect the raw material. So it is very important to focus a lot on the collection because once we have that quantity, um, available to us for the facility, then it's a go by all the investors and, and everything. And, you know, it's take, it could take off from there. But it's just a proof that we could get, and this is in excess of maybe um, 20,000 tons annually of um, waste plastics that would be required. So, you know, it's about all about the collection, um, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted everybody to finish before I said thank you very much. I mean, some of the things that while you guys were speaking that I wrote down was, you know, the importance of walking the talk. You know, we have said a lot. We continue to say a lot. We continue to write plenty policies. Um, but we have to really act. We have to be able to walk the talk. We have to, to move into action and move into action a lot faster. You know, um, Ronald, and that was from, that's what I got from Nalini and Ronald, Ronald said, begin with the end in mind, you know, understanding what, what is our end goal, what is our end purpose, and then work backwards. How do we get there? I mean, as an entrepreneur myself, <laughs> that's a question I often have to ask myself, you know, what is my, what do I want to achieve with this? And then work backwards and say, okay, what are the activities I need to do to help me to get to this final point? And I mean, the thread that has been throughout the entire conversation is the importance of collaboration. Collaboration um, is the new currency. It is the way we need to move forward. We cannot continue to operate in silos. I think we are too small as an island community for us to be able, for us to be still doing that. You know, I want to hold on to my things. And no, 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 I don't want you to do it because I want to do it first. You know, those are some of the, it's almost like you're with a bunch of children and you take away their favorite toys. I mean, so yes, that's the parent coming out there. But at the same time, you know, we have to ensure that we may have different paths, but our goals are the same and we can do more together. The saying, the proverb is right. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that is what we really, really need to embody. Um, and we really need to, to come together as a region uh, to suit our own interests and to seek our own best interests, right? Um, so Luke in the chat had a question. Um, so let me let me just touch on Lisa's first. These will be the last two questions and then we'll wrap up because we're 10 minutes before we close. 
So Lisa asks, are there any converters anywhere in the region with whom recyclers can partner? Anybody could tackle that one. Um, so let's see with that one first. Are there any converters in the region with whom recyclers can partner? I think probably the converters they're talking about might be um, facilities to recycle, if if <laughs> if um, I'm not mistaken. If it's that, then um, there isn't any um, large scale one. There may be some smaller ones that would um, collect the plastics, maybe um, convert them to granules or compress them into bales and, and export. Uh, in terms of my knowledge, um, there isn't any right now. There has been, but I don't think they're currently in operations. I can be wrong, but that's based on the knowledge that I, and information that I have. Nalini and then Ronald? Uh, yes, we actually work with uh, Gravita Limited, Inter Gravita International Limited, an Indian company that had operations in Jamaica, I mentioned previously, and in the Dominican Republic. Um, so they have pelletization plants. They collect the uh, PET and HDPE, and they produce pellets uh, and flakes in some instances. Um, and they also have some operations in South America, which I think is where the majority of, in terms of regional closeness, uh, the majority of uh, plants operating right now are, uh, I think, uh, El Salvador, I want to say. Salvador. Okay, and Ronald? And I'll just add to that, uh, there are a couple plants in Honduras in particular, and then um, in the wider region in, in Brazil and, and Mexico. Um, there have been a number of plants within the Caribbean region themselves, itself, but, uh, but those have, yeah, for one reason or not, uh, closed down over a period of time. Okay, I've heard of the I've heard the the one in Honduras mentioned before, so I definitely am aware of that one. So thank you very much, Lisa, for your question. And this final one, um, which I believe in one of Majid's um, questions, he did answer. So Liu asks, you briefly mentioned the financial challenges for the recycling industry. Can you list a few challenges in more detail? Well, Luke, I don't know if you'll get more detail right now, but <laughs> We could shoot for, let's see if we could answer this in two minutes. Uh, could you list a few major challenges in more detail? For example, is it that there are high interest rates? Is it that there is a lack of expertise within the financial institutions? To that point, Luke, I will give you my answer as well. I would say yes, on both counts. Um, are there any financial institutions or banks in the Caribbean region that have shown particular interest in the plastics recycling? space. So you mentioned briefly a few of the challenges. Um, he wants, uh, Luke wants to know of the challenges, sorry, in more detail. Is it high interest rates? Is there a lack of expertise? Or is there any other that you could pinpoint? Um, and are there any financial institutions that have shown interest in plastic recycling, in the plastics recycling space? So Majid, you can go first. Yeah, I, I would. Um, I would you have a two cents. You could add it in after. Go ahead, so, Majid. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, recycling in the whole for financial institutions are considered high risk. Once they're considered high risk, then everything associated with that high interest rate, um, you need to, you know, cover in terms of the financing. They're looking for the collateral. They want to see heavy collateral. They want to make sure that. Um, they want to see not just um, MOUs, but they want to see potential contracts, right? So they want to hear from the, the potential suppliers. They want to hear from who is going to purchase the products from you. They want uh, more than MOUs, but they want, you know, draft contracts and stuff like that. So all that um, presents uh, challenges because in order to get those, uh, for example, uh, we are looking at someone who might be able to supply some of the raw materials but they have available now, right? Um, we don't know, you know, if the plan comes in, in in one year, two years time, if they will still have that available. So it's difficult to get somebody to commit to say, well, yes, in 2025, we're going to have 10,000 tons of um, of available materials for you. So all that would be uh, falling into the high risk uh, for the financial institutions. Um, there have been a couple marketing and advertising. We have been in conversations with a couple um, who have been showing interest, 
but most wants to see a lot more information than than what would regularly be regularly be asked for in terms of uh, more low risk uh, potentials. So that's that for me. Thanks, Majid. Anyone else wants to add something really quickly before I wrap up? Yeah, just to so quickly add, it's it's a typical chicken and egg scenario um, in the sense that banks want to see um, sources of supply and so, and to have sources of supply, you need to have the, um, the, the, the final processing. So that creates yeah quite a challenge for persons like Majid and, um, and others looking to invest in recycling. I would add just really quickly, um, you know, there may be some hope. I, I see a lot of at least two of the local banks recently uh, adding some sustainability elements to their portfolio very visibly. Uh, it remains to be seen what really is the scope of this sustainability commitment. Uh, if it's just, you know, printing less receipts and turning off the lights at night, or if it's going to translate into, as we're speaking of, you know, real hard uh, funding that's going to the right areas so but we we have seen some progress they have acknowledged the core you know the sustainability role and uh, we'll we'll see how it goes thank you and to luke's point as well i do feel that there still is a general lack of expertise within our financial institutions who truly understand what the concept of sustainability a sustainability business a green business whatever term we want to call it, um, because I have been asked some truly mind boggling questions um, in the past by financial institutions. And I have to say, no, 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 that's not my business model. I don't operate like that. So understanding that business models are different, especially for us that operate green enterprises or impact driven businesses, social enterprises, um, and so, uh, back to my comment that the, the money has to be patient and long and with grace because we need to understand the dynamism of the space that we are operating in. So with three more minutes to go, I would allow each person one minute, a time in your order, one minute to bring your closing remarks. So I will start with Ronald. What are your, to wrap us up, what would you like to leave the audience with? We just need to keep at it. Um, so as we discussed, there have been a number of pilot projects, there has been attempts at regional approaches, um, but we need to keep at it, we need to keep the collaboration going, we need to keep the efforts going, we need to get more involvement of the different stakeholders, and it's, um, it's, it's a hard job, but it's a necessary job, and you know, we have to keep on encouraging each other. Um, to, to continue. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ronald. With 10 minutes. Good job. <laughs> Majid, your final words, what would, you, what would you like to leave our audience with? Uh, working together. We need to continue. And you mentioned it before, you know, everybody, we have to stop trying to do it on our own. And we have to work together to to push this industry forward. It's a very critical industry. And, and um, I believe the lady had mentioned as time go by, it's getting more and more difficult for us um, in terms of this industry. So working together, working together, working together. I hope that was half the time. I swear. Yeah, man, you're a good student. <laughs> you listen in, very good, Nalini. Um, yes, you know, I, I would say that this is not optional. What we're discussing and what we're working on in our individual capacities and across the region, not just for the Caribbean, but it is not optional. You know, it is mandatory. And it is very, very frequent that we become jaded, <laughs> you know, as professionals who've been in the industry and have seen many of the pilots come and go. We can get jaded, but you know I agree with Ronald. We can draw from each other and each other's experiences. I've left Jamaica very uh, invigorated because I saw a model that can work, and achieving near twenty percent recovery rate was a big win. It you know many countries might scoff at it, but I think it was a win, and I definitely think that that area of just sharing what works 
you know, my personal experience is that informal sessions, discussions like the ones that we are having right now, are often more useful than the big forums and conferences and the, you know, those sessions where uh, they look good, the pictures are lovely, uh, and the takeaway is often small and the follow up even less. So I would say that we have to continue to, to work together to encourage each other and to share our lessons learned and translate those lessons learned across the region because we don't want to, we don't have the time to waste in terms of duplication of efforts and trial and error. So uh, the lessons are there and we have in our own capacities lessons learned. So uh, we have to press on, we have no choice. Thank you very much, Delaney. The only student that misbehaved, but a well-loved student nonetheless. <laughs> So thank you very much to you, Baji, to you, Lalini, to Ronald for taking the time out of your schedules to join us today in our discussion for plastic recycling in the Caribbean. I hope you guys have been able to take away something from our discussion and to recognize that collaboration is key, working together is key, and to use Nalini's words, this is not optional. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll just turn over to Sweetha to bring her final closing and we'll see you all on the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you so much to Majid, Ronald and Nalini. This was a very vibrant discussion today. It was a little late at my end. I was still uh, in rapt attention to what you were speaking and we had quite a few questions. Thanks a lot to the audience. You were uh, very engaged today. It was really, it's always great to have a webinar like that. A reminder to all the audience, our webinars are recorded. They'll be up on our YouTube channel in two weeks. But if you've registered to this particular webinar, you'll have access to it on Zoom anytime from now. Thanks a lot to our speakers once again. Uh, and we will have another webinar with Sean later this year. So keep sign up to our newsletter and you'll get updates about it. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.